So, hey folks, my name is Jasmine Malone. I am the Equity, Inclusion, Diversity, and Culture intern at TechSoup. And today I'm very, very, very honored to uh, introduce y'all to this webinar titled um, Black LGBTQ Plus Nonprofit Leadership. And today we are featuring two very amazing nonprofits based here in the United States. The first will be uh, Black Trans Advocacy Coalition and the second will be Oklahomans for Equality. And I just wanna go over the, the best ways for um, you all to engage since this is a webinar today, you will see three options at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the chat option, the raise hand option and the Q&A, please, please, please put your questions into the Q&A section and um, make sure to and make sure to um, put your questions in there throughout the webinar so that we can reach the, so that we can address them at the end. Also, um, please shout out in the chat um, if you like what you're hearing or if you wanna know more, learn more. Also be aware of the chat. I will be dropping some links throughout the presentation. And if you, are, if you um, would like closed captions, they are available at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on the CC option in the Zoom menu. And now I'm going to pass it over to today's facilitator, Aaron Ford. Hey folks, welcome. I'm so glad you are all are able to make it and welcome to our panelists today. Um, I wanna start just by kind of calling out what the purpose of our event is today. Um, so the goal of this event is to highlight the black and LGBTQ plus voices of TechSoup nonprofit members. Um, and to educate our TechSoup communities about the histories of Juneteenth and Pride um, and the people that exist at the intersection of these identities. I do want to uh, mention just to folks that we did get a little bit of feedback when we originally posted our event um, that um, some people thought that we were equating Juneteenth liberation with LGBTQ plus liberation. And I wanna just explicitly state that that's not our intention. Uh, we don't wanna equate the histories of these two groups. Uh, we Rather, we wanna really give voice to identities that exist at the intersection of those two uh, identity categories um, and to sort of bring some attention to uh, specifically what what the title of the, the webinar is now um, black queer nonprofit leadership uh, <clears throat> so that's what we'd like to do really emphasize that we're um, really trying to give voice to that specific kind of intersection Uh, before we get there, I want to just give a brief, really brief introduction to the two kind of events that we're commemorating today. One, the first is Juneteenth, and Juneteenth commemorates the date in which enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, were formally notified at the end, of the end of slavery in uh, 1865, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And that observance recognizes Black liberation. It celebrates freedom and calls attention to current issues faced by the Black and African American communities. And it became a federal ho holiday, as I think most of us know, uh, in 2021. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons we're, we're focusing on our event near Juneteenth, which of course was on a Sunday um, today. The other event that we're commemorating today is uh, Pride Month, which is generally um, considered to come out of the gay liberation marches, which started in 1970 in New York. Um, these marches were a direct response to riots in LGBTQ plus spaces, most famously the Stonewall riot in New York. And today, of course, we have hundreds um, of LGBTQ plus pride celebrations around the world, and many of those are held within June, although not exclusively. I want to also just give a really brief shout out to the two groups that uh, sponsor this event. We have uh, two affinity groups at TechSoup that uh, organize this thing. The first is Black Allies, um, which is an affinity group for Black employees at TechSoup, but it was founded in December of 2021. And their mission is to ensure the visibility, development, and inclusion of Black and African voices within the organization of TechSoup, within our network, and also the communities that we serve. 
Uh, the other a group that is sponsoring this event is Alphabet Soup. It's an LGBTQ plus affinity group at TechSoup that's formed by uh, LGBTQ plus employees of TechSoup in July 2020. And our mission is to support inclusion and diversity, sexuality and gender within TechSoup and our greater community and to spotlight intersectionality with other identities while creating alliances. And a fun fact is Alphabet Soup is also the name of the youth group um, of one of the organizations that we're working with today. Um, and that organization is Oklahomans for Equality. So their youth group is also called Alphabet Soup. I'm gonna briefly just uh, introduce our panelists, although they're gonna give much deeper introductions themselves of who they are. Um, from National Black Trans Advocacy Coalition, we have two folks. We have Carter Brown, who of course is the executive director, and also Celine Butler, who is an employment access specialist. He's uh, really working on the jobs program that they have. We also have Kayla Morris from Oklahomans for Equality. And so that's the, the organizations that are going to be uh, uh, kind of speaking today. The format that we'll have is we'll have each of the two organizations speak, and then we'll have some time for Q&A and more of a dialogue and conversation at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to pass it over now to Carter and Salim, who are going to discuss at the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition. Well, hello and greetings, everyone. Again, my name is Carter Brown. My pronouns are he and him. And I serve as the founder and currently the executive director of the National Black Trans Advocacy Coalition. We are a national nonprofit organization headquartered here in Dallas, Texas. And our core programs in advocacy is around uh, social advocacy and bringing empowerment for Black trans gender, and non-binary individuals. Um, we are very, very excited to be here. Happy Pride Month to you all. Um, and we're very excited to be presenting again with, um, with KO here. So we'll get into it so that we'll have plenty of time for questions. Today, we want an open conversation on the intersectionality of specifically Black trans identity and nonprofit leadership for Black liberation. Um, so I'd, I'd like to share with you all just a bit of a background of how we came to be um, as the National Black Trans Advocacy Coalition and some of the work that we do um, in respect and in effort to achieve Black liberation for ourselves and our community. Next slide. Okay, so um, the National Black Trans Advocacy Coalition, we were founded in 2011. And I was compelled to start the organization just based on my own experiences as a Black transgender male. Um, in my walk or my transition a very long time ago, um, and at that time, the, we didn't have the amount of resources or visibility or even just support of allies that we do now for transgender people. The thing to do at that time that we knew um, community-wide was that you embark on your transition and you sort of go under the radar, not disclose that you're trans. There was no pride in being trans per se. However, there was a perceived level of liberation um, in being, to, being able to live in the gender that you identified as. And so that's what I did. I transitioned to live in the gender that I identified as, and then I went into hiding as such, quote unquote. And I did, I uh, changed jobs, changed my name, changed where I live, and I didn't disclose to anybody that I was transgender. And actually, I was very happy at this point in my life as I uh, started to advance in my career now that I was being received as fully male. Um, I received lots of promotions in a job that I loved. I got along well with coworkers, um, and I was able to build a family and really feel that I was living what I always understood to be a normal life until the day that I went into work and someone disclosed um, or I was informed that someone had disclosed that I was transgender. And the, uh, the, the complete turn and contrast of the relationships that I'd built um, were very devastating to my mental health. My social, uh, my social life was completely destroyed and I was embarrassed, I was hurt, I was distraught um, to see that people that I'd build relationships with and that respected me as a person no longer 
felt that way about me because of my transgender identity. Um, and needless to say, I was eventually fired for being transgender from that place. And in that moment, I knew that uh, that would change my life forever. I had to decide in that moment if I would deny or uh, embrace the life that I had chosen to live for myself. This life that I, that I thought would, would liberate me was now confining me to a place that didn't feel well at all. And so that is what compelled me to start the organization in an effort to advocate um, for all of the socioeconomic needs that Black transgender people have, specifically um, at the intersect, intersecting um, identities of being Black and trans. And I, I, I wanted to ensure that not only advocate for myself, but others who are simply trying to have access to a livelihood and work and be graded on their, on their actual um, merit and, and, and work um, and not be able and not be discriminated against for being trans. So that's a, a brief background of us. My wife, SB, she has a business development uh, degree and she serves currently as the de business development officer of the organization. Next slide. More about us, the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition. Again, we're a national social justice organization and we work to overcome violence and injustice in the world through the power, value, and love of all people. And I, I, actually, I really love this, um, this uh, statement of who we are because it, it acknowledges that it takes the value, love, and power of all people in order for us to truly reach the liberation um, of us all. Our motto is to become the change that we wanna see in the world. And indeed we have been very successful at becoming the change because our leadership is comprised of black trans people. And that keeps us in tune with all the key issues that our community um, and the people that we serve um, that we're fighting for. Next slide. Again, our mission is to help improve the Black transgender human experience by overcoming violence and injustice through the world, through the power and love of all people. So who is in the coalition? Uh, the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition in our effort to ensure that we are having more of a holistic approach to our advocacy and our support systems Within the coalition, there are uh, gender specific and identity specific um, groups. So for example, we have uh, Black Trans Men Inc, which focuses on the unique needs of tra Black transgender men. Um, and then Black Transgender Women focuses on the needs of Black transgender women. MX is for our non-binary group. And then we've also created a pageantry system, which is the only uh, the first and only uh, trans-specific pageantry system for those in entertainment so that we can bring advocacy into the entertainment realm as well. Our anchors is for the spouses and relatives, family and friends of Black transgender people with the understanding that often the transition includes our family members as they transition with us um, in, in getting to know who we are as we blossom into our uh, identity. Golden Flames is for transgender people who are 55 and up. Thank you, next slide. Okay, and as I stated, our leadership, uh, we are a completely black trans led organization. Um, and this is very, very important that our leadership uh, also gives representation um, and the service that we give to our community comes from Black trans leadership. And I think this is pivotal when we talk about um, Black liberation because as, you know, before the, trans, the transition, I was Black. After the transition, I'm Black. And in any place that I, I occupy, if I don't disclose that I'm transgender, it's simply known that I am Black. Um, and so for our Black liberation, we have to, um, 
it, it's necessary that we're able to connect with our community and our, our Black community, but often because of the transgender identity, we are ostracized even from our Black families, or our Black communities, or we push further into the margins um, to receive access to things that our Black um, brethren and, and communities can receive. And so, you know, that's why it's important that our leadership is for Black, is by Black trans people because it's a unique journey and experience that we understand um, and that often many of us are going through as well. Um, as well with our leadership as a part of our effort to, to um, liberate our people, we've identified the negative influences of white supremacy in the workplace. And so for our, for our, our uh, staff, we put into practice um, things that are, are affirming and nurturing um, that, you know, that create meaningful communication and relationships among our staff, affirming, them, affirming us all in our identities as well. Um, and so I'd like to share now a bit more specifically about the programs that we do. And so I'll be handing it off to Mr. Salim. Yeah, happy Pride, everybody. Um, yeah, so I've been connected with the organization since 2012, when it first started off as just like an online group. Um, I was also early on in my transition, so it was great to connect to people uh, with similar experiences who were also black and trans. Um, and because resources and visibility were scarce, um, having this platform was a literal lifesaver. Um, I went on to work in workforce development within the LGBT community. Um, and early on, I saw gaps within employment services that really needed to be addressed. Most of the young people that came to me um, identified as trans and gender non-conforming um, and, but they needed more than just employment services. They were dealing with things um, like being homeless, not having access to food, dealing with disabilities, immigration status, um, and, you know, as it related to, you know, trying to get employed. Um, and as we can see from the stats, 20% of Black trans people experience unemployment, 34 experience poor health care, and 42, which is almost half, um, have experienced homelessness. So these were things that needed to be addressed um, to even get people to be able to sustain the employment services that we were offering. So when I seen um, the opportunity, you can go to the next slide. So when I seen the opportunity to work um, at BTAC, I jumped at the, the chance because I knew that BTAC was our, their primary focus was on health, housing, and employment. So within employment, we offer our clients um, help with resume prep, um, you know, job readiness, as far as like interview prep as well. Um, and, and one of the most um, important things that we do is we connect them to trans-friendly employers. And we do this by offering um, our employee partners uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training to make sure that the clients that we connect to them um, are going into a safe work environment. Additionally, we provide free HRT care, um, financial assistance with surgeries. We offer link linkages uh, to trans-friendly public and private shelters um, wherever they're living, um, as well as we offer emergency assistance um, to people that need um, immediate resources. So one thing I love about the organization um, is that we are focused on healing the whole person um, because we know that one of these programs standing alone won't do it. Um, they all intersect um, to be able to sustain uh, trans black trans people. So to me, you know, black liberation is about showing up as your whole self and all your transness, your culture, your fluidity, and even in your trauma knowing that there are resources and community that can support you as a whole person so that we go from not just surviving, not just barely making it, uh, but to thriving in all that we are. So I'm gonna hand it back, uh, back over to Cardi. Thank you very much, Salim. Um, 
Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Just showing up as your whole self is something that I didn't have the experience of just being a Black trans person. As I stated, you know, you know, the happiest that I could be was to not let anyone know that I was trans. And so again, to create, um, to take that trauma and create, um, be a part of creating something that affirms a work environment that truly does invite and encourage people to show up as, as their full self um, has been very, very rewarding and very liberating for myself and those who are part of the BTAC team and those who experience any of our um, programs or events. Um, I really love this quote here. It says, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. This is a very, very powerful quote for you know, the reasons that you perceive it to be um, as well for me, because it outlines that um, our intersectionalities give us the opportunity to find those commonalities of our humanity. And that's where we find how to become allies or how to um, give more when you really see that your liberation is tied with mine as a Black person, or your liberation is tied with mine as someone who's celebrating pride today, as someone who's celebrating Juneteenth this week, as someone who believes in, in having equality in the workplace, um, et cetera. So once we um, start exploring those intersectionalities is where we find true our true uh, humanity and, and uh, allyship. And that's why I really appreciate events like these today. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to share a couple of other things that we do um, towards the healing and empowerment of ourselves in the communities that we serve is that we do um, DEI training, such as what we're doing now, and as well as trans competency training. Um, also discussions on racial and gender justice. We do these conversations with uh, several corporations, businesses, schools, medical providers, anywhere where transgender people will be, uh, we try to ensure that it, it is created to be um, an affirming space or transitions to be an affirming space. Lastly, um, our biggest and annual event is our conference. Um, the Black Trans Advocacy Conference will be happening here in Dallas, Texas um, in 2023, April 25th through the 30th. And this is the biggest event for our community because it is the first and only and largest event that truly centers Black trans people in the programming, in the entertainment, um, in, in the uh, environment as a whole. Um, so we have hundreds of people come from all around um, for this full week of just to be in community. Um, in that space, we also provide leadership training and opportunities for community building, um, as well as entertainment. Um, there's also sponsorship opportunities um, and opportunities for vendors. If you are, if you provide a service or um, you just want to be in community or you want to support, you can find out how to do all these things um, at btac.blacktrans.org. Um, so again, in a nutshell, that is who we are and what we do. And again, we're very thankful for this time and opportunity to be a part of TechSoup's um, Pride and Juneteenth celebration. And we'd love to hear more from you uh, following this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carter and Celine. Um, that was really, really wonderful and inspiring to hear the amazing different kind of programs that your organization is really working on and really tackling some, some issues that as you've outlined are just really uh, uh, pervasive in the black trans community. Uh, so I just really, really powerful and inspiring work that you're doing. Uh, now we have a brief presentation from, uh, from Keo Morris, who's going to talk about Oklahomans for equality. So welcome Keo and uh, let's, uh, let's start with hearing a little bit about your organization. Hello, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is K.O. Morris. I'm the BIPOC program and digital media coordinator and Tulsa Pride director for Oklahoma for Equality. 
Um, and I'm just here to tell you about what we do and, and, and to share my story. Next slide. So Oklahoma for Equality was founded in 1980. Um, it, it was founded by a group of, of Tosins who um, wanted to create a community, um, who, who wanted to create a, a, a system of, um, of help for those who, who, who were needing it. Um, so they were founded in 1980. Um, they opened up their first center in 1996. Um, they moved around um, a couple of locations in town every time they bought a building or rented out a building. The neighbors would complain that there was a gay community center in their backyard, or the owners got tired of the building being, being vandalized. So um, they came up with a plan to purchase the um, current building we have, we have downtown in 2005. Um, they made renovations and opened it up in 2007, and it's an 18,000 um, square foot facility, um, an old torpedo factory, um, um, and we host a health clinic, we have transit support groups, um, we have legal services, um, every Tuesday you can come down to the center and ask for legal, legal advice, and we have um, a lawyer who will give that advice free of charge. We have an Equality Business Alliance, which is um, businesses uh, in and around Tulsa that are LGBTQ friendly and affirming. Um, so you know that when you go to this business, that this business is a business that will support you and, and won't have any problems. Um, we have an art gallery um, and each month that art gallery changes out um, um, to a different local artist to display their work. And that artist gets to keep 90% of their proceeds of the art that they sell. We have a computer lab, we have a library, we have a youth program called Alphabet Soup that meets every Saturday. And that program has about 80 kids, um, depending on, on, on the day. And then we have behavioral health services. Um, we are a shelter, so in case of um, emergency weather, you can come to the, to the center and be safe. Um, right now, it's like 90 degrees outside in Oklahoma, very humid. Um, and you and people who are, are unhoused or need a safe a safe space, they are free to come to the center and um, hang out, um, get free water. We do have Wi-Fi cable, so you can come and hang out and enjoy um, some time to yourself. We also have a history project room, which where we keep a collection of gay history, not only for the center, but for gay history of the state, which is um, available and free to the public to access. We have an event space. Um, that hosts numerous events, pride bingos, um, or a more color art exhibit where, where we have over a thousand art pieces um, submitted. Um, um, we also have a Lynn Ricks Theater, which is named after um, a gay Cherokee playwright. He wrote Green Grows the Lilac that got turned to the musical Oklahoma. Um, so we have that in honor of him. He struggled with being gay and, and, and alcohol and living out in California. So we have that in honor of him. And we have tons of other programs that, that we have and do. And, um, and, and yeah, the, the organization is very wonderful. We have several chapters across the state. Um, we have five in, in, in the state in Eastern Oklahoma, and we plan to expand even more and to have um, a, a present in a lease of town of at least um, 10,000. Um, next slide, please. Um, so some of the programs that I oversee um, that kind of relates to um, what we're talking about today is um, a core Black Voices series where we highlight core Black Oklahomans and to give them a space to tell their story. And because and, and, we all know that, that being Black and queer is not, not a monolith. We all have different backgrounds and stories to tell. So, so what I think my job is, or what I feel like my job is, is, is to uplift and, and, and give a, a, a platform to those who, who need to have their story told. Um, the, more we, the more we can tell our stories, the more we can progress and move forward. Um, so Queer Black Voices is, is one of those programs that we do. Um, we interview Marie Turner, which is um, one of the first um, non-binary legislators in, in, in the US and one of the first Muslim um, elected rep represent representatives that we have in Oklahoma. We also interviewed um, Mike, um, Michael Vaughn, who, who oversees a, 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 a tech um, um, school for, for youth learning how to code. Um, we also interviewed Lincoln, who oversees our Black Wall Street Alliance, to tell the story of, of Black Wall Street and, and to make that connection of, 
of entrepreneurship and, and, and to give um, this a voice to, to Black people and queer Black people. And these people have been such a strong advocate in, 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 in their own rights and their own journeys to, um, to rope in what they do while also being queer and, and letting people know that queer people exist here and, and they are part of, of the legacy of Tosa. Um, we also do in Dizzy Queer, which is a space created for queer and two-spirit um, um, peoples, which is also very, very, very important because um, as, as we celebrate Juneteenth, um, which, which was in 1865, um, being in Oklahoma and being enslaved in Black, um, um, the tribes ha had their own sovereign government, which, which did participate in child slavery. Um, um, black Oklahoma, black queer indigenous people or black indigenous people weren't freed until the following year in 1966 when they had signed a new treaty with the with the United States government. So so while our our black brothers and sisters were were celebrating freedom, um, there was still black people in Oklahoma still under living under child child slave, slavery um, in, to, to the following year. Until this day, a lot of Black freedmen um, are still fighting with the tribe for their citizenships and their rights. And something that the tribes are still fighting for or fighting against is um, our queer two-spirit people as well. So, so we're very adamant in ensuring that these stories are being told about our queer and indigenous people and, and to ensure that this is not hidden under the rug as, as the tribes are trying to do. Um, next slide, please. So, so also part, part of what we do is, is supporting local organizations, um, um, supporting other Black organizations, uh, other core Black organizations. Recently, um, Black Quirtosa, who just started um, within the past year, um, they had their first Black Pride in Tosa, which was amazing. Um, they had a ball, they had um, a Pride in the park, and they had these different events. But supporting these other black organizations is, is key to progress. Um, and some of those some of those organizations that we have here are Black Queer Tosa, Carefree Queer, and the Oklahoma Center for Community Justice, and also expanding those chop, expanding our presence and and what we do to the rest of the state because Oklahoma is is very red and and we have to get some of our smaller cities on board. Um, um, to create the change that, that we need to see. So we're trying to replicate what we do in Tosa to our smaller cities like Muskogee, like Tahlequah, like Omuggy, which is um, the, the capital for the Muskogee Nation, and Tahlequah, which is the capital for the, Cre the, the Cherokee Nation. So we're trying to expand our presence and to ensure that programs that we have here are also programs that other people can access who don't live in a bigger city like Tosa. Um, next slide, please. And, and, and this is celebrate and this and this the uh, conversation around being black and queer and, and a black queer liberation and what it does look like. And that to me, this is celebrating yourself, celebrating who you are and 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 being truthful with who you are. And and if that and if that means um and, and what that means is 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 being yourself. So so I dress very flamboyant, I wear a lot of heels and and it took me a long time to get to the point where I can truly be myself. And, 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 and being yourself helps other queer youth who look like you feel visible, say, hey, I see you. And, 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 and having them not be afraid to be themselves and knowing that they can be themselves, especially living in, in a place that really isn't allowing people to be themselves. So, so that's just, um, that was my quick presentation, um, and what we do here is is, is just providing us a, a, a safe space and, and resources for people who are, who are struggling and needing that support. Um, um, and that's my presentation. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Kao. It was really powerful, I think, in particular for me to hear a little about how um, queer folk uh, really fit into the sort of really important Black historical um, uh, sort of uh, events in Tulsa and the, the history of Black Wall Street, Wall Street and also um, the discussion that you had of the Black freedmen and their um, relation to, to the tribes in Oklahoma. 
Um, so we're moving into our uh, discussion portion where we're happy to take questions and, and for our panelists. I want to uh, first address a question which was already answered in the chat. Will the deck be shared with the recording? And yes, the deck will be shared with the recording. Additionally, within this deck, there are quite a few hyperlinks. You've all seen that Jasmine has been very active in the chat of dropping some hyperlinks into the Zoom chat. Those hyperlinks are also in um, the deck itself. So you'll be able to come to TechSoup's website and also be emailed out to the participants of this webinar, um, the, the deck itself with those links. So um, you will have that as a resource. Um, Jasmine's also uh, pushing for us to uh, ask further questions in the chat. <clears throat> Um, I do see that there is uh, one question for TechSoup, uh, which is specifically for African American led organizations. How are we providing services to that community? Um, well, we so we serve quite a we have quite a few African American organizations and led organizations, uh, folks that are led by African Americans and also that have tremendous impact that are part of our network. Um, and uh, in addition to African American, we also have Black organizations throughout the world that are part of our network. Um, I, I will say that we uh, had a, a specific digital resilience outreach to a bunch of folks um, uh, that I think began two years ago uh, during like a, a specific moment of racial reckoning. Um, and so we got a lot of organizations, a lot of free services, which was great, or reimbursement sometimes at services that they paid for at TechSoup, so specifically targeting African-American-led organizations and folks in that community. Um, that's one way that we've specifically done some outreach in that um, community. And uh, Jasmine, but I was wondering, as a member of Black Allies, if you'd be able to speak a little bit more about what TechSoup does for the African-American community. Thank you, Erin. Um, so just to talk a little bit about Black Allies, and I know I really want to get to the questions um, that are directed at our panelists, so I will be brief. But um, one of the reasons that Black Allies was started was to continue to um, uphold some of the promises that TechSoup made during um, back in 2020. So I'm just going to post a link in the chat here. This is a blog post that was posted um, back in 2020 by TechSoup. And it has some commitments in here that are directly um, related to the Black non led nonprofits in the United States and how we want to engage the Black community. And one of the ones that um, Black Allies focuses on as we started um, the affinity group was to um, not only amplify the messages of the Black led community organizations, such as what we're doing today, but also specifically looking to raise money to defray these costs and support the optimization and technology for Black led organizations and community groups. And um, since Black Allies is a newer affinity group at TechSoup, one of the ways that we're starting to do that right now is doing a lot of research and um, starting to do outreach with these Black led nonprofits that are in our network, as well as engaging some, some newer folks so that we can um, fulfill these commitments that were posted in this, in this uh, blog post. So hopefully that answers that question. I'll pass it back to you, Erin. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so yeah, so next I have a question I see from Allison, um, and she says, this may be vague, but what is your day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week look like? And I think what she's trying to get at is, uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, your daily activities. And this could be a question for Carter, Salim, or Kao, anybody who would want to jump in. So, so my day-to-day -day looks like um, I, I go in, open up the center, um, answer some phone, um, answer messages that people may have left overnight while the center was closed. Um, and then, and then I go from there and then there may be people who come in looking to this call off um, there may be someone looking for some, some healthcare providers. Um, so we have a list of those, um, not only in Tulsa, but they may be, they may be from McAllister, which is about 80 miles away from Tulsa. Um, so we may have maybe one or two in McAllister that, that we can connect them with. Um, they may be looking for um, mental health services or housing services or any resources um, that we would try. If we can't provide those resources, we have um, um, community partners that we collaborate with that we can then direct them to, to, to those resources. Um, if, if we have a group or some type of event, we will get that ready. Um, so my, my day really, really varies um, depending on, on what's happening, what we have planned. 
um, yesterday, um, this past week, um, or this week, we're getting ready for our Pride event this weekend. So yesterday, um, my my day was full of um, of of our interface service, which is where we fly the what we we'll bless the flags that fly over in the center, which is the Black Lives Matter flag, the Progress flag, the City of Tulsa American flag, and the Muskogee Nation flag. And we also read the names of all of those we lost from from last pride to this pride and 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 to honor them and, and to give their their and 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 just to highlight and recognize them so so my, my day varies um but most of it is really just helping those in need and, and and finding resources for those needing those resources thanks kale go ahead Salim. Yeah, for us, uh, we're a national organization, so we mostly work remotely. Um, so my day to day looks like logging in um, on our on our server, um, seeing who has emailed in for you know employment service because I'm the employment access specialist. So that's specifically where I work within the organization. Um, you know, I usually have like client meetings scheduled. Um, and so, you know, I do a lot of case management uh, within my program and, you know, basically finding out what kind of employment needs, uh, you know, that our clients have, whether that's, you know, like I said, help with resumes or, you know, looking for a specific job or maybe they're going through like a career shift, um, you know, out of, you know, whatever, you know, unsafe environment they've been in, you know, and looking for a more transfer me. Um, work environment, so helping them navigate that and kind of having conversation, uh, finding out, you know, what their traumas have been um, within the workforce and, you know, trying to figure out what resources that we have that can support them. And so, you know, uh, additionally, uh, we're in the process of developing a job board. So I spend a lot of times like looking for employer partners, um, seeing who we can outreach to, um, that already have like safe work environments um, or have like trans or queer friendly um, job opportunities to add to that job board. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, basically what, you know, my day to day looks like is just like building up the program and also just working with clients um, to help them uh, find employment opportunities. Salim. So next we have a couple of questions that I'd like to maybe combine a little bit. So Laura uh, Burns asks, uh, she works with a, an organization that works in food insecurity and a community that her organization has not been able to identify how to assist yet is the LGBTQ plus community because they're less likely to have geographic boundaries. So she asks how the panelists would suggest beginning to identify ways to reach these people. Steve Worlin, uh, it, also works with uh, an organization that provides direct resources specifically to folks who are unhoused. Um, and he asks, can we speak, can you speak more about the intersection of black trans and black queer identity on the one hand and the experience of homelessness on the other? And what resources should we be uh, exploring to better serve these individuals? How can we better engage those we serve from this lens? So I think a, a, a string that I can pull from both of those questions is how can we really uh, work to identify Black queer folks and better serve them in direct services. Go ahead, Carter. I believe um, the services are already out there. Um, we just need to give access to Black trans and queer people um, to the services that everyone else is already getting. And that just means, you know, introducing um, these sort of conversations on recognizing and acknowledging, bringing forward, is there space for everyone here? So if there's a community uh, space or a, a city sponsored space, public space that you recognize that you don't see, um, not that everyone's identities are all visible, but if you don't know of any LGBTQ people in that facility, speak up, challenge them into opening up what is already created um, to be inclusive for everyone. Um, I don't think there's a need to, you know, create entirely new spaces for resources when there's a plethora of resources for everyone that's already out there. It's just a matter of giving everyone equal access um, and opportunities to get to those things. 
However, I do feel it's important to have um, identity specific spaces when it comes to support or having community and people that can relate to uh, your experience and walk of life because you have to know how to navigate those things or it's helpful to have a guide or someone who has experience in navigating a way of life that's not um, the, the common way. Um, you need someone to show you how to access uh, getting these resources that aren't freely given to you. Um, so that's why, you know, for us, our presence is very important to community as a staple for them to have a place that they can call home and they can just go and be in their full identity and know that whatever resources are available are fully available to them and not be challenged in that. However, we can't do everything, obviously, but through the love of, through the love and help and allyship of us all, that's how we actually get to the equality and get to um, having full access for everyone, in my opinion. Yeah, just to, 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 to piggyback on, on what Carla said, it, it's really that the resources are out there and, and it's really just um, collaborating with those other resources to ensure that, hey, um, maybe you didn't think about this, but this is where, this is something that you should think about. Um, um, we have, a, we have a, a number of, um, of, um, of, of um, housing shelters and, 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 and house shelters for people who are experiencing homelessness. And, and we worked with one of our, one of the partners and we was like, hey, you know, there are trans people who are, who are in the house and, and would like to have a safe space. Um, and, and we ended up um, um, working with the Tulsa Day Center and, and, and they ended up creating um, um, a space for, for, for our trans community who, who was in the house to feel safe and, and, and to know that they won't have to, um, worry about about sleeping at night and, and, and they'll have um, a safe space to sleep so so it really is about collaborating with, with your community partners to ensuring that they understand that there is a need for for this community and to ensure that they that they can do within their power creating a space for that community thank you Kao and Carter both thank you uh for kind of explaining that I think that really uh is inspiring to think of how collaboration and uh, uh, really working with different organizations to from in the in the planning level uh, really can can help get operations targeted in in some really interesting ways. Uh, Lashika asks, "What volunteer opportunities do you have with an audience here? Uh, if if you uh, could use some volunteers, <laughs> what 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 ability do folks have to volunteer with either of the organizations?" Um, to volunteer, we're always looking for volunteers at the center. It makes my job just a little bit less stressful. <laughs> um, but but to, to volunteer at the center, all we ask is um, is you to just pick on um, any day of the week. Um, we're open Monday through Sunday, um, nine to nine. Um, um, we only ask for three hours of your time. Um, um, and and it, it's really just a wonderful way to give back. And um, um, the simplest thing you can do is, is just volunteer and, and 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 to give back to your community, where where that is answering phone calls or volunteering at Pride or volunteering at, at any of our other events that we may have. Um, um and, and and just and just giving back. Um, to to your, to that community is it, very impactful and and it goes a long way. A lot of people don't realize how how volunteering at, at any organization can make a can make a, a true difference for that community. Thank you, Ko. Go ahead, Carter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well said, Ko. I definitely agree. Um, we need all those things. Uh, but yeah, we have lots of volunteer opportunities all year long, um, especially around the time of the conference. We need as many hands on deck as possible for things like, um, you know, actually setting up on, on, on site, um, as well as coordinating programming. Um, throughout the year, we need volunteers for all of our programs. Uh, as Salim highlighted, we have a very robust employment program. We could use volunteers to help us 
with uh, perhaps facilitating or orchestrating some of the job readiness workshops, if that is your skill set. Um, also, we could use volunteers um, to help with, you know, our social media and content creation. You know, everything that any nonprofit needs to run, we need volunteers for. Um, and, and it's often the things that we maybe have not identified that we need um, that you can identify that you have that's the missing puzzle to really get us to the next level so for example um, if you have a skill set or if you have um, you know a, a passion that you love to do and although you may not see it as one of our programs but if it's something you can offer up uh, by all means we welcome that as well um, Again, you can uh, log on to our website if you want to sign up to volunteer and we'll definitely match you with an opportunity that both um, satisfies our needs and your passion to help. Thank you, Carter. And Kayla, I, since you're Tulsa based and very your operations are very much in Tulsa, I'm assuming that volunteering at the center is for folks in Tulsa. Carter, I'm assuming also that since your organization is nationally based that you can kind of handle some volunteer work coming from a lot of different places. Yes, yes, absolutely. We can do everything remotely. Or if you're in the Dallas area, you can come to our office. I would love to have uh, some hands on deck here as well. Um, yeah, so just sign up and we'll definitely match you with an opportunity. Another, I think, uh, way that we can take advantage of uh, some folks in the room is Sean has a question about um, fundraising. And he would like to pose the question, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you face in terms of accessing grant funding? Mm, there's uh, quite a few challenges for black, black led organizations or nonprofits overall face um, with securing funding for us. It has been because we started as a grassroots organization, we didn't have the funding or capacity to uh, hire a grant writer um, or to write the grants ourselves in a satisfactory way to win the grant. And that was a really big challenge for us, even though we were doing the work, you know, that doesn't satisfy um, a grantor. So it was a challenge over time, just um, learning to write grants, learning to find grants um, for trans specific work, because that's an even smaller pool of grants when you look at you know this is if there's a grant pool for black people um we're we're probably not gonna get anything um and if it's a grant pool for lgbtq then there's a fraction that's for trans people that's not gonna go to the black ones and then if it's a trans specific grant then usually it's more so uh given to to fund whatever that initiative is, highly and likely it's gonna be HIV or something that the government is tied behind or um, is highlighting as this is what the issue is versus um, something that's gonna support what we're saying the issues are such as we need jobs, we need housing, we need access to, trans to gender affirming healthcare. There aren't grants for those things uh, specifically, which is why we work so hard to fill the gap um, with the capacity and the knowledge and the resources that we have as an organization, and then collaborate uh, with others who already have, again, who already have the, um, the resources that we need, we just need access to them. Um, so it, it, those are a few of the challenges in accessing grant funding for trans, Black trans specific work. Um, I, I'll try to answer this the best I can. Um, um, so, so the Equality Center, um, um, prior to COVID, um, um, we what was funded privately or are or, or by individual donors, our, our family foundations. So, so we're, we're lucky enough to not really, um, really yeah, depend right. to depend on grants. Um, um, but this past year, we we did finally hire a grant coordinator. So that has been life changing, and like Carter said, um, writing those grants are are is, is very difficult, and and just because you're doing the work, 
doesn't mean that you are get to grant. Um, um, grant writing is, is is very difficult, and and we're so lucky to have um, um Donna Matthews who who came from Divis, um, who are now working with us to to write our grants. And let me tell you, that is a lot of work and a lot of information that you need. And just because you're doing the work does not mean you're going to get that funding. Um, um, and, and like and like Carter said, a lot of it is tied behind um what the what, what the federal government is promoting and pushing. Um, but 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 we have been lucky to really um not have to really rely on grants um prior, prior to COVID. Um, but but grant writing is is something serious, and, and fundraising ha has been difficult, especially um post COVID or or post COVID. Um, um, outbreak. Thank you, Kao. Thank you both for highlighting, I think, some of the real difficulties in, uh, uh, you know, kind of qualifying for the grants the right way or getting the grants uh, when you're really at the intersection of these different identities. I think uh, it can be challenging. I do want to um, mention that both organizations, you can donate to the organization directly from their web pages. Um, so we're running close to time. I do have one more question that I want to uh, tackle pretty briefly. This one's more for TechSoup and the organizers. And why did you combine Juneteenth and Pride is the question. Um, I, I think what we really wanted to do uh, was uh, have a collaboration between our two affinity groups. So uh, Black Allies approached uh, Alphabet Soup saying, hey, uh, we think that this could be a good moment because these two uh, events that we're commemorating happen near the same time in terms of the time of year, it could be a great way to show uh, some of the important work that's being done at the intersection of these two identities. Um, so our intention was really to do that, to really spotlight folks that are right there where those two identities kind of converge. And uh, Jasmine, uh, uh, you were one of the organizers as well as I was. The other two folks, I'll just call them out, uh, who worked on this webinar were Kevin Mulhall of Black Allies and Bruce Ackley of Alphabet Soup, as well as the whole other rest of the community backed us up too. But those two folks I did want to call out. But Jasmine, do you have anything to add there? I do. So thank you, Aaron, for that. And um, also thank you for asking that question. I think it is a very important one. I know that we um, addressed it briefly at the top of this webinar as well, um, really wanting to highlight the folks who exist at the intersection of these identities, but also in thinking about Juneteenth and the history behind that and slavery, while also talking about pride at the same time, wanting to really acknowledge, and Carter mentioned this, um, speaking about his own experience with his own identity in the workplace um, and transitioning, but Black people have always existed within this intersection. There have always been Black queer people. So we're talking about this throughout time and it, taking the moment now to acknowledge both of these things, again, with Pride and with Juneteenth, talking about um, how best to, to highlight these folks, how best to engage this community and to help them um, work through some of the issues that have been mentioned today that are still affecting them. So it was really important to us to make sure that we made time for that, to, to highlight both of these very, very important observances and to talk about how TechSoup can, can reach out to these Black-led nonprofits, these Black queer-focused nonprofits as well, and how we can reach these communities and how we can also help our ed, um, allow these communities and these nonprofit leaders to educate our TechSoup greater community um, in addressing how best to um, provide direct resources. Thank you, Jasmine, very, very well said. Um, so I appreciate, I wanna call out uh, Kale, Carter and Salim who took some uh, time during the session to talk to us and before the session to prepare some content, work with us really closely. And I really wanna appreciate your time and thank you uh, all three. Um, I wanna just read also this really quick quote from Rebecca that uh, Rebecca, our CEO at TechSoup threw into our chat. Uh, and this really resonates with me. This is how I feel also. Thank you for sharing your stories and for the important work you are doing. Both of your organizations are impressive and vital to your communities. Your resiliency and creativity is to be admired. Uh, really, really well said, and I totally agree. Um, Carter, Salim, and Kayla, any last minute things that you wanna say uh, just uh, as we close? 
Uh, I will just say thank you again, TechSoup, for uh, giving you know a platform for our voices and our experiences to be heard um, and for your allyship. And hopefully we will get a chance to hear from some of you all uh, following this meeting as volunteers or see you at BTAC 2023. Yes, thank, thank you for having me, um, and thank you for putting this together. Um, um, we're all in this together, and, and the only way, only way to progress, the only way for it is as to collaborate and move together. And we're all human, and we all deserve love. And and I wish nothing for the best for the world. And I just wish everyone a happy pride. Yeah. Again, thank you for having us. Um, you know, thank you for letting us share what our needs are as an organization. Um, and I look forward to connecting with you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for attending and taking some time on a Tuesday to hang out with us. Uh, look out for an email with a recording of this event as, as well as the slide deck, which will also be posted on our website. Uh, and if you have any tech needs, uh, email Kevin as he threw in the chat. Uh, and if you uh, wanna check in with any of us, uh, or just have some comments, uh, there will be ways to do so. There's also a survey that Aretha or Jasmine, or maybe both even, I have been monitoring the chat as much, put in the chat and that will also go out with the email. So we would love to hear from you about our programming and uh, how we can uh, serve you all. Thank you so much and everybody have a wonderful Tuesday. <laughs>